Thank you. Whoa. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Wow, what a, what a welcome. It's a terrific place, Iowa. Terrific. We just got in and we were driving. I'm driving through these beautiful fields. I want to grab that corn like you've never seen. So rich, so beautiful. And thank you for being here on a Saturday. I know you could be doing a lot of other. I mean, we have such a huge crowd. We have another room that's packed like this one. And uh, people standing outside, they, I don't know if we can let them in, if we can put them up, but we had so many people standing outside. I just want to thank you. And actually, the Des Moines Register is standing outside, too. You know, it's a, it's sort of funny. So it, it was sort of funny. So, you know, it's a super liberal rag, not respected around here. But they come out with an editorial, Mr. Trump. I'm rated number one now in every poll because you know what? People are tired of what's going on. Not because of me. They're tired. And they said, so you're number one in every poll. And they're saying, you should drop your candidacy. I say, excuse me. I mean, you know, why? But uh, it's such an honor to be here and to discuss some of the things that have taken place over the last week. This has been a big week. First of all, uh, Hillary is now officially under investigation for the emails. Big. That's big. You know, if you look at it, look, I don't think anything's going to happen to her because it's all Democrats that are doing the investigation. I mean, it's the way it is, right? And you, <laughs> you look at, you look at uh, the prosecutors, they're all Democrats, and they want jobs, and they want to continue onward. And, uh, you know, the Attorney General is a Democrat, right? Oh, that's different. I agree with that. <laughs> but uh, so you have all of these people and it's just a game that goes on in Washington. It's terrible what's going on. And you look at General Petraeus as an example. So he was a general, did a very good job. Although, I don't know, you know, that whole thing is such a disaster with what's going on. But he did a good job and he was a respected guy. And he did much less than Hillary. Much less in terms of information, in terms of importance, in terms of volume. I mean, he gave a little bit. You're talking about years and years and thousands of emails, and they destroyed his life. His life is over. They've destroyed him. He's like a ruined man. I saw him, he's like a ruined man. And with Hillary, she's supposed to be running and she's favored to win. Not against me, she's not favored, I'll tell you that. But she's favored to win, so. Look, if the prosecutors are honorable, and they may be, if they're fair, if they're just, sadly, bad stuff has to happen because what she did is very criminal and very serious, and it's too bad. It's too bad. And I don't, I don't know how a person with that cloud over their head actually can be running for the office of president. You know, you wouldn't think so. So we'll see what happens. It'll be very interesting. Uh, and you don't hear that talk from other politicians. It's almost like they have, you know, even these Republican guys that I'm running against, it's like, you're not going to hear that. You know, they protect each other because they say that could be them, that could be this, I got to take it easy, I don't want to. Me, I don't care. I say the truth. So I went to Laredo. And my wife came home and she was crying. And I said to myself, why are you crying? You made it home, you made it safely from the border. <laughs> she was crying, tears were coming down her face because she thought it was so dangerous. And I said to myself, she either really loves me a lot or she's got a pretty good line of stuff going, okay? But it was a little bit, you know, scary going over the border. And while I was there, and by the way, I have to tell you the mayor, Pete, great guy, really great guy. And he's a Democrat, but he's a great guy. And they gave us such good treatment. The law enforcement there is unbelievable, including the Border Patrol. You know, they were told, as I was in the air from Washington, don't be there for Trump, don't be there for Trump. They're the ones that invited me. The Border Patrol, they're incredible people. And they were told in that area, which you'd call local, but there are hundreds, there are actually thousands of Border Patrol guys and women Tremendous people, like the people I just met outside, some of the law enforcement people, the sheriff, some of these people are great. 
I'm not going to mess with them. It's true. Now, I looked at some of these people outside. I said, you know what? Nobody's messing with me today, not with them. But, but when I went there, I, I saw, you know, the mayor. Couldn't have been nicer. I saw the city manager, Jesus, great guy. And they gave me a whole big tour of a lot of different things. And the Border Patrol people were told not to be there from Washington. They were told from Washington. I wonder who told them. I wonder. <laughs> but they said, don't be there. And, you know, by the end of the trip, many, many Border Patrol people came to see me anyway. I mean, they actually disobeyed orders. And I actually made a third stop that wasn't anticipated right by the airport. And I spoke to law enforcement and a lot of the Border Patrol. The reason they wanted me to be there, you know, it's pretty simple, especially down in the valley, it's really dangerous. It's really, really dangerous. This is the border. Remember I made the statement about Mexico is sending and people are coming and everybody says, oh, what a horrible thing. Well, now I've been, I have journalists calling me up. I have people calling me up saying, we apologize. I was right. And then, <laughs> and then of course you had Kate, beautiful Kate, incredible family, the mother, the father, the brother, Brad, they're incredible people. I spoke to them. And you have these people, and they are living in hell. They lost this incredible person, shot, as you know the story very well, shot by an illegal immigrant that came over. I don't know if he was forced over or he came over five times. And then the fifth time was disastrous for a family and for a country, frankly. And Jamil, the football player, young boy, Incredible father, Jamil Shaw, who I got to know, unbelievable kid. And he was uh, coming home, he was walking home from the deli, a few minutes away from the house. And his father tells the story, I mean, everybody, even the reporters, I knew some hard veteran reporters, and there's tears coming down their eyes. We had a conference in California a couple of weeks ago with six families who lost their children to illegal immigrants. It's a big problem, such a big problem. And nobody wants to talk about it. Such a big problem. In the case of Jamil, applying to Stanford, excellent player, good student, incredible parents and father, who I got to know the father really well. And he was five minutes away, and this guy just walks up to him and shoots him. And after he's down, he takes a gun and shoots him again. And he didn't do anything. In fact, he called his father. He calls his father affectionately, like my kids. They, he said, Old man, he used to call him old man. Old man, I'll be home in about four minutes. And right after that, a minute later, the father heard a shot. And he said, oh, no, no, that can't be. And his son was laying there, shot by an animal, an animal that shouldn't have been in this country. And people coming across the border are coming from many places, not just Mexico. I mean, they're coming from many places. And, you know, they tried to put a Mexico thing. I love the Mexican people. I have such a great... I have, Thousands of people over the years, thousands of people from Mexico, from all over, Hispanics that work for me. They're incredible people. They work hard. They're great people. And Mexico is a country I respect. And I've said this. The problem is that their leaders are too smart, too cunning. They're just better. They negotiate better. They're tougher. They're much smarter than our leaders. Our leaders are dummies. They don't know what's happening. It's true. No, they're incompetent. They're incompetent. With our sanctuary cities, nobody even heard the term. And frankly, I hate to brag. If it wasn't for me, you would still never have heard of the word sanctuary city. I hate to tell you that. And, you know, things that we never even heard about. And what's happening is there's a movement going on, folks. You know, there's a movement going on, and it's a very strong movement. We want to take back this country. We have to take it back. We have to take it back. And actually, one of the very big reporters called me and actually used the word movement. Because it is, you know, they just came out, The Economist, just came, very highly respected business magazine, very respected poll. And they just came out. And I think I'm at 28. And Walker is at 14. And we'll talk about Walker in a second, because that's a whole big story. But Walker's at 14. I think Bush is at 13. 28. They're saying, what's going on? It's a movement. I'm telling you. 
So, so when I was in Laredo, I met some incredible people. And, you know, I'm watching. And I'm watching thousands and thousands of trucks and buses and cars. Basically, it's a gate. It's a gateway into Mexico. And I asked people that were there, experts, because they were giving me like a whole big charrette. And I asked some of the people, I said, so l let me guess, because I'm looking at these cars just flowing and trucks flowing into Mexico. And again, I respect Mexico for this. I like Mexico for this. I, I just wish our leaders were the same. I'm not knocking them. I don't knock China because they outsmart our country. They make, we rebuilt China with the money they drained out of our country. We rebuilt it. That doesn't mean I, you know, the largest bank in the world is my tenant. How can I dislike China? They pay me a lot of money. It's true. Chinese bank, the biggest, so much bigger. I said, how does it compare to Citibank? That is like small subsidiary. That's what they told me, small subsidiary. No, I have the largest bank in the world. I sell millions and millions of dollars. I mean, when I sell a condo for 25 million to a man from China, for 45 million, for 30 million, for 10 million, for 5 million to China, am I going to dislike them? I love them. <laughs> but their leaders are much smarter than our leaders. Same thing with Mexico. Where they're making a fortune. And I respect that. So people said, I don't like Mexico. I love Mexico. I just want our country to be well represented. You know, free trade is a good thing, but the one problem with free trade is you have to have really smart leaders, and you have, great, have to have great negotiators, because we're being killed. We're being killed in negotiation. So, while I was at Laredo, I noticed something very unusual. I, I saw, number one, I saw the traffic was so massive. And they were so nice to me, they stopped the traffic for while I'm there. I said, do me a favor, let those poor people go. They said, no, no, we want to stop. Let them go. They go into Mexico to spend money. But here's what happened. So while we're there, you probably read it. It was in Drudge. Who's great, by the way? Drudge is amazing. But the story in Drudge, and big story, it's all over the place now. Guys swimming across, and big bags of stuff, drugs, swimming across the river, right? Swimming right across. And they put the drugs, and actually the camera crew, or the reporters, were petrified because they thought they were going to be killed. Because they're showing this on camera. The guy's carrying bags of stuff. It was drugs. And then ABC, the big one. I always call it ABC at 6.30. But the big one. And they have their cameras they're setting up. And two guys go running by them. And there are two other people running behind them trying to catch them from the border. This, and this is the good part of the border. Because as they say, oh, the valley is much, you know, the valley is, that's trouble. And I, I saw something that was amazing. I said, so let me see, the drugs come through, and what goes back? Cash. Oh, so Mexico has the best of all worlds. Again, out of respect, the drugs come through, and the cash goes back to Mexico. So we get the worst of two ends. We lose our cash, and we have drugs all over the country. How stupid are we? How stupid? Now think of it, how stupid? So that wouldn't happen with me. Believe me, that won't happen with me. And we have, you know, sometimes you say, sometimes, and it was a great experience for me. I mean, I told the pilots, I said, fly a little bit away from the border, please. Just, you know, get, fly a little bit inland. But it's, it's a whole scary thing. You know, when you're afraid to walk into your own country, you're pretty bad, hard to believe. You don't have that problem in Iowa, in all fairness. But it's pretty rough out there. But think of it, so the drugs come in, we get the drugs, bad stuff. The cash goes out, bad, I mean, so we get it. But, so it's gotta be straightened out. We need a border, it's gotta be strong. Combination of walls, combinations of fence, combinations of great border patrol. These people are great. The reason they wanted to meet me is because they wanted to explain how bad it was, that's all. They didn't like the way I look. They liked what I said. And many of the families that testified last week before Congress, whose children were killed, I was so honored by it, more honored than just about anything I've done. They said if it weren't for Donald Trump, nobody would even know how serious this problem is. I was so honored, almost all of them said.
So we need borders. We have to stop illegal immigration. And by the way, immigration's a great thing. Legal immigration. It's a great thing. And maybe we should speed up the process. We should definitely speed up the process. And we should take people in that are great people. Sort of a merit system. You know, when I went to school, I had like a merit. We did good and, you know, we felt good. We got an A, we got a B, we got a C, whatever we got. But we don't have anything. We just have people flowing in and staying. And in some cases, they're not people that Mexico wants. Because they say, why should we take these people that are rough? Why should we take the certain people that are rough and put them in our prisons when the extremely dumb politicians in the United States will put them in their prisons? Or worse, or worse, will not put them in prison at all. We'll let them just roam around shooting people and killing people. Okay? So then we have another thing happened this week, the Iran deal, okay? You know, I say, I sometimes start speeches by saying, we don't win anymore in this country. We don't win. When was the last time we won? We don't win. When did we beat China in a trade deal? We don't win. When did we beat Japan? I mean, Japan sends us millions of cars. I was in Los Angeles last week. I looked at some of these boats. They're the biggest boats. I've, I've been around. I've seen boats. They're the biggest boats I've ever seen. They're sending us millions of cars. We send them, in all due respect, wheat. Okay? Not a good trade. I love wheat. It's wonderful. But I'd rather be sending the cars than the wheat. Does that make sense to you folks? <laughs> we send them cattle. And in many cases, as you know, you've been reading, they won't take our cattle because the farmers don't want it. They're always fighting to get it in. And yet they drop millions and millions of cars. So I heard that the stat is about, let's say we're 100% over here and we're under 20% over here. So we're sending 19, 20% and not as profitable stuff because it's very perishable. So we're and very expensive to transport. Where's a car? You put it on the boat and it goes, right? So you get, you, we're sending them very perishable stuff here. That's 20%. They're sending us automobiles that we have up to our gills. So that's over here, right? And I said to myself, so easy. All you have to do is say, hey, look, you won't take our cattle, you won't take our wheat, you won't take anything. You don't want it because you say the farmers don't want it. That's okay, I understand that. But maybe we'll cut your cars down to the same 20% so we have a balance, okay? <laughs> That's all you have to do. No, it's all you have to do. And if you think that Hillary or Jeb or Scott Walker, in all fairness, will be able to negotiate with Japan, you're wrong. You're wrong. It just doesn't happen. You know, it's like, why is Jack Nicholas a great golfer? He can't even explain it. Nobody knows, really. Why? It just is. Got something in your gut. Why are the great baseball players great? Why do they hit? They ask Babe Ruth. He had more home runs one year than the entire league. It's pretty good, right? And people would go up to Babe Ruth and they'd say, Babe, Babe, how do you hit the long ball? And he'd say, I don't know, man. I just swing at it. <laughs> it's called talent. Talent. Well, you know, a business person, a good one, like me, but a good one, and some of the people in the audience, by the way, and you know what I'm talking about. I mean, a good one, uh, just, you, you make deals. I mean, I buy things like Doral. I bought Doral. Hundreds of acres in the middle of Miami. It goes up. I don't know. It goes up. I mean, I make good deals. I could get other guys. There are other guys. Great deals. Great deal makers. We don't use them. We use Carolyn Kennedy in Japan. Excuse me? She couldn't even believe she got the job. They said, would you like the job? She said, really? But she has to be good. My daughter, Ivanka, likes her, so I think she's a nice person. When Ivanka likes her, do you ever hear of Ivanka? <laughs> so, but we want, we want people, and I tell it all the time. I know people, the greatest negotiators in the world. I know them. I know the good ones. I know the bad ones. I know the overrated ones. I know people that you've never heard of that are better than all of them. That's what we need negotiating for us. Now, some of these people are horrible human beings. 
you wouldn't have them to dinner. They're vicious, they're crude, they're unhappy. They treat everybody badly, who cares? I want them negotiating against China, if you don't mind. I mean, there's so many, you take a Carl Icahn, it's a friend of mine, he'd be great. I'll say, Carl, take China. We'll be do, we're gonna do very well. Okay, that's the end. I don't even have to say do this or do that. You take Henry Kravis, you take Schwarzman, you take, there's so many, and they're great. But we don't use them. We use people that are donors. We use people that are friendly with the lobbyists. And it's a big problem. For instance, I read where Jeb Bush raised over $100 million. Now, if you think that those people giving him all that money aren't getting a lot, you're wrong. And not always in favor of the United States. You have China, you have countries that have lobbyists. You actually have countries that have lobbyists so they can make good deals. That's why everybody makes good deals. And here's the beauty of me. I couldn't care less. I hire the lobby. I know these guys. No, I mean, I know them. I know the lobbyists. I have them. When I need something, sometimes if I don't know it myself, you know, I give to everyone. When I was a businessman, I get a lot of criticism. Oh, but you gave to the Democrats. Who cares? I was a businessman. I, I give to everybody. A U.S. Senator calls me. Congratulations. I, you know, I'd, I'd like to be totally idealistic, and I largely am. But the system we have is broken. Because a guy like Bush, a guy like Walker, all of these people are controlled by the people that give them their money. It's true. When I give money, I don't know if I need anything, but two years later I'll call a guy, yes, Mr. Trump, what can I do? Well, you know, I'm having a problem with this or that, but we'll take care of it. I built a great business. I built it very legally, legitimately, but our system is broken. We can't have that. And I, I give the example of Ford. Have anybody heard me talking about the Ford plant? Huh? Should I do it again? Do you mind? I just give, because it's such a great example. So Mexico's done a fantastic job from an economic development standpoint. Not only with the trucks going back, I'm talking big. It's becoming the car capital of the world. They're doing an amazing job because their people are very smart. Their leaders are very smart. And Ford announced that they're going to move a lot of their workers out of this country, but in particular, they're going to build one plant, $2.5 billion. Do you ever see? Hey, in Iowa, $2.5 billion, that would build a plant bigger than any field you have. Is that right? $2.5 billion. I said, wait a minute, you mean $2.5 million, right? They said, no, 2.5 billion. Okay, it is, 2.5 billion. So they're gonna build this plant to make cars. And these cars are gonna be sold all up, but they're gonna come into the United States. No tax, no nothing. What means, you're not gonna have, you're gonna close up in Michigan, you're gonna close up another place, you're gonna build this massive plant. And I said, so what would I do if I'm President Trump? It'd be very easy. I wouldn't even call any of the people I told you about. I don't have to call Carl Icahn. I don't have to call anybody. I can do this so easy. It's too easy. I do it with a phone call. I'd call the head of Ford. And I'd say, congratulations on the new plant you're building in Mexico. I think it's a wonderful thing. Congratulations. I'd say, thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me give you the bad news. Every single car and truck and part that comes into the United States, we're going to tax you 35%. Okay? Now, now, here's what's going to happen. He's going to say, Mr. President, Mr. President, you can't do that, Mr. President. I don't care about him. I care about the country. I care about the country. So he's going to say, you can't do this. You just can't do this. It's too late. We saw it. It's, it's okay. Good luck. Build your plant. I don't care, but you're not going to rip off this country. You're just not going to do it. We want jobs in the United States. So, 100%, this isn't like 99.9%, .9%. this is 100%, here's what's going to happen. He'll call me back probably that afternoon, but he may play tough and call me the next day. Does that make sense? Right? He may want to be tough. In the meantime, I will have been called by different people in Washington, some of whom I know, but they don't give me any money, I don't care about them, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. And many of them work for me. They work for me. 
And they'll say, Mr. President, you know, what you did with Ford is really not good. I mean, they've been a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, there's no way. I went to the Wharton School of Finance. I was a really good student. I know that, that ain't good for the United States, right? So there's, you know, all of this stuff. I'll say, look, I want it here. And the next day, I'll get a call from the head of Ford. He'll give me one more pitch. And I'll say, Mr. President, we've decided not to build that plant there. We're going to build it in the United States. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Now, let me explain something. That's 100 percent. I mean, my only question is, will it be that day or the following day? OK? That's what happens, 100 percent. And I, I would make my own phone call. I check ethics, first of all, but I guess I can't be guilty of anything if I'm not doing, like, I don't know. You know, with this crazy laws now, you can be guilty if you do something that's good for the United States. You know, it's a little bit tough. So I'll check ethics. I may have to have somebody else make the call, but I'll probably be able to make it myself. I have good lawyers. So what happens, <laughs> so what happens, I said to myself, okay, that's me. I say, got to move back, sorry, I don't mind. The lobbyists see me, the donors see me, everybody sees me. I say, I don't need your money, I never took any of your money. You have no control, bye-bye. Now here's what happens with President Walker, whose state, by the way, is a disaster, but I won't say that. Here's what happens, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. Something happened today which was not nice. Or it's President Bush, or President Hillary Clinton, if she makes it. No. Well, it's all the same, to be honest with you. It's a system. It's all the same. So they may be, I mean, these aren't stupid people. So they probably know that building a $2.5 billion plant in Mexico is not exactly the best thing that can happen to us. So they may even say, let's stop that. They will be bombarded by their lobbyists that donated a lot of money to them. Again, Jeb raised $107 million so far, okay? They're not putting that money up because it's like a wonderful charity, although it is a charity, but not for this country, for other countries. They're putting that money up. So their lobbyists, their special interests, and their donors will start calling President Bush, President Clinton, President Walker, pretty much whoever is president other than me, other than me. And they'll say, you have to do it. They, ca they gave you a million dollars to your campaign, and this one gave you five, and this one, you have no, you have to do it. You know what he's gonna say? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and the plant will be built in Mexico, and we just lost lots of plants all over our country, okay? That's what's going to happen. And folks, this isn't like maybe. It's 100 percent. This is 100 percent. And then the same thing happens in China. Japan is back. You know, they have a really good leader, smart, cutting the hell out of the end, making it impossible for us to compete. People are running Komatsu tractors now instead of Caterpillar tractors. Japan is back, big league, big league. You people know, you, you are in the farm business, you know what I'm talking about. They're big league ordering stuff made in Japan because they've so cut their currency, they've devalued their currency so quickly. Now, China is an A student on currency devaluation. In the history of the world, there's nobody that plays with currency better than China. And Obama has no clue. He, honestly, I don't think he has a clue. I don't think he has, in fact, in that stupid trade bill, they didn't even talk about currency devaluation. And they called me up and they wanted to know if I'd get support, if I would support. I said, well, their number one economic power is devaluation. What do you say about it? Nothing. We don't talk. That's their, that's their power. It's not publicity. The power is exactly that. It's currency devaluation. And they're genius at it. And we're not. And by the way, our dollar's going up. You know, it sounds good. Our dollar's going up. Sounds good. Strong dollar. Except for one problem. You're not going to have any business. That's the problem. Somebody like Obama hears, oh, it's a strong dollar. Oh, that's great. Except we lose all our business. It's great for me. I can buy property all over Europe. I can buy it so cheap. I bought Dunbeg in Ireland. I'm in Scotland. I'm all over the place. I bought the great Turnberry. They're having the Women's British Open at my place. Turnberry, one of the great resorts of the world, one of the great golf courses of the world. I bought it. I bought it. And you know what? Here's the problem. Next week, we have the Women's British Open, one of the greatest majors in the world. I don't even know if I'm going to be there. Do you think I'm going to be allowed to take two days off and just go for two days and see, should I or not? Or should I say, no, I know. My people say, oh, can you stay here and make more speeches? I say, can I just go see for two days? Two out of four days. I mean, you know. So anyway, but it's at Turnberry. But you know, you can buy 
over there because the dollar and what's happening with all of the other currencies. And let me tell you, I mean, there are certain good things about a strong dollar, but mostly it's going to suck us dry. It's going to be a real problem. And you can see it, and I know you people are seeing it. You're seeing it big league in this world, in this business. So we go and we have people, and we can make our country so strong through negotiation. And you know, the Chinese have a lot of respect for me. I made a lot of money. I own a big chunk of the Bank of America building in San Francisco. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows what I own. You know, I have these guys, maybe he's not worth 10 billion. I think he's only worth seven. <laughs> I'm actually worth more than 10, but you know, that's a, remember they said he'll never file? They said he'll never run. These guys are arrogant. You know, they call them the walking heads. You know, the political pundits. They're arrogant people. They're terrible. And you know, the ones that hit me the hardest are the conservative ones. The liberals like me better than the... It's the craziest thing. And I have nothing liberal going about me. I think they like my style better. You know, it's funny. But the walking heads. So they say, he'll never run. Ever, never. You know, with such confidence. Then I announce I'm running. They say, oh, well, he'll never sign his paper. You know, it's a single page which sort of says, you know, you're putting up your life. Big, big thing to sign. They'll never sign his FEC paper. I signed the paper. That's it. They said, huh, well, putting yourself in the line. Hi, folks. I feel guilty with these folks. How's my hair look back there? You know, it is... It is my hair. I take more abuse. I had a story recently that was so good. They say he's a financial genius, but he said they, he wears the worst hair piece I've ever seen. I'm saying, I can't even give the story to anybody, and it's not true. Anyway, so they said he'll never, ever in a million years sign his paper, sign the paper. But then they say, oh, but he'll never put in his financials. So I have these accounts. I paid a lot of money. I have these counts all over the place, because I think it's 98 pages or something. It's the largest one ever filed. It's the largest numbers ever filed. And I put that in. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. They have no idea what to do. And they thought I wouldn't file, because they said, well, he's probably not as rich as people think. But then it turned out I was much richer. Now they don't know what, they're really screwed up. Much richer. In fact, I'm so proud, I'm unlike Mitt Romney, you know, he ran from it. And his numbers were peanuts in all fairness. But, but, and I was very disappointed, because he choked. I mean, he, I don't know, something happened to him that last month, month and a half. I don't want his endorsement, believe me, I will get it. But, but he choked. That last month and a half, he was a disaster. I said to him, Mitt, why aren't you on television? Obama, say what you want about Obama. He was on Jay Leno, he was on David Letterman, he was all over the place. I said, where are you? And he wasn't there. So he choked, you know, like an athlete. Sometimes they choke, and that's bad. But I put the numbers in, I put the papers in, and then I go, and now people think I'm running, because, you know, nobody thought I was running, because they listen to these people. So now people say he's running, and then the polls start coming out, because, you know, when I'm not running, it's different. Let me ask you a question. You, because you look so friendly. Stand up for a second. Before you, with the glasses, handsome guy, stand up. When... Before you thought I was running, you wouldn't give me a poll because you say, hey, Trump's great, I love Trump and all that stuff, but he's not going to run, I'm not going to wait, right? But after I run, it's a different story. Now you're like Trump, is that right? You better believe it. See, I picked the right guy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See, that's a very dangerous thing to do because it could be he's not a Trump fan and then the whole day is over, right? <laughs> Thank you, that was great. So the polls now are coming out. And I'm just killing everybody. I'm even, like, surprised. And a lot of people are surprised. And the biggest people are calling me saying, this is a movement, as we said. And it's just a great feeling. And the feeling is, and then they say, oh, here's the new one. Well, he's having a good time. He's having a good time. If you think this, I mean, I love you people. I love Iowa. But it's hot as hell in this room. I'm sweating like a dog. <laughs> And I could be doing something else right now. I mean, honestly. He's having a good time. He'll eventually leave the race. Why? I've already had Macy's 
who's, which is a terrible company with chicken. I mean, just a chicken company. The guy was a good friend of mine, and he let me down. And you know why he let me down? Because I want to stop illegal immigration. So they got angry. And it was peanuts anyway. It wasn't a big deal. But I just hate to see. And by the way, so many people are boycotting Macy's. It's so, I love it. I love it. I love it. Because that's what's wrong with our country. People are afraid to do the right thing. They're afraid. Then I heard I was losing NASCAR. Headlines all over the world. And I had friend, a friend called me from Paris, France. Oh, Don, it's too bad about NASCAR. You know, they have these headlines. Trump and NASCAR to sever their... Oh, 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 illegal immigration. Sever relationships. He said, how big a deal was it? I said, they rented my ballroom for an evening. That was the deal. They rent... <laughs> And I'm going to rent it to somebody else, hopefully for more, and keep their deposit. That's what they be. That was the deal. True. <laughs> then the next day, headlines all over the world. You saw it. ESPN to sever ties with Trump. I get calls from my friends. Oh my, oh, Donald's so bad. You're taking such a beating. You're taking such a terrible beating. And you know what that was? That was a golf outing in Los Angeles on a wonderful course along the ocean that's fantastic. So now they're going to a third-rate course and they're not very happy. And by the way, they all say, don't worry, Donald, we'll be back next year. Okay? That's, that's the way life works. So I'll, I'll just tell you, so I'm on the plane, and I see this vicious tweet, because I've been nice to Scott Walker. And, I, you know, he's a nice guy. He came up to my office like three, four months ago, presented me with a plaque, because I helped him with his election. I like that he was fighting. You know, at least we, I didn't know what the hell he was doing, but he was fighting, and I like a fighter. Does that make sense? <laughs> so I've been very nice to him, but he brings me this beautiful plaque. I don't know who pays for it. Does he pay for that, or does Wisconsin pay for it? I don't know. But it's beautiful. And I'm being very nice to him. And then today I read this horrible uh, statement from his fundraiser about Trump. I said, oh, finally I can attack. Finally. Finally. I would have never done this. I didn't know. Because I hear I'm, the only one beating me in Iowa is Scott Walker, and not by that much. And he grew up, you know, he grew up next door. I mean, he's like right next door. Little advantage, right? Except Wisconsin's doing terribly. It's, it's, first of all, it's in turmoil. The roads are a disaster because they don't have any money to rebuild them. They're borrowing money like crazy. They projected a $1 billion surplus. And instead of a one billion, I wrote this stuff all down. Although I don't need it because I have a really good memory. But they projected a one billion dollar surplus. And it turns out to be a deficit of 2.2 billion dollars. And money all over the place. It's, the schools are a disaster. And they're fighting like crazy because there's no money for the schools. The hospitals and education is a disaster. And he was totally in favor of Common Core. Did you know that? He was totally in favor of, and which I hate, I hate. You gotta educate your children from Iowa, not some bureaucrat in Washington making 100,000. I mean, you got to, there's something that to me I don't get. I mean, Bush is totally in favor of Common Core. Now, with Bush, I'll give him one thing. He stuck with it. In a way, I'd rather have him stick with it. Because he stuck with it. He's still... In favor. Scott Walker changed when he saw he was getting creamed. So he changed. So now he's not in favor. But he was strongly in favor of Common Core. And their interest, they borrowed so much money that a big portion of their budget now is paying for it. So what he's doing is kicking it down the road. And he's the only guy that's ahead of me, and I, I can't believe I'm in second place. I finally am in second place to Iowa, but he is next door. But folks, will you please put me in first place so I feel better? <laughs> so, we had the illegal immigration, and last week it became heavy, heavy, heavy with our incompetent leaders in Washington. I hate to use the word leader, because they're not leaders. Our competent politicians in Washington. Uh, and it really turned into 
a battle for the veterans, because nobody fights harder for the veterans than me. I built, with a small group, the Vietnam Memorial in Manhattan. <laughs> Believe me. And I got a lot of credit for it. And I put up the money. So, years ago, and I tell this story, you know, I, I put up a lot of money and got worked hard with a very good small group of people. And we built the Vietnam Memorial because they were never treated properly, especially from Vietnam. They were never treated properly. And I'm not so innocent or anything, but I felt this is something I can do. This is my wheelhouse. This is what I do. I'm good at that. I'm good at money, and I'm good at building things, right? Does that make sense? I might not be a great soldier. But I don't know. Maybe I would. Maybe I wouldn't. But I'll tell you, I am good at this. And we built this gorgeous... And I've done many things like that. Woolman skating rink in Central Park, so many different things. But never has any group of people thanked me so often. And this was years ago. This was a pretty long time ago. But every time I see a vet, and especially a Vietnam vet, they say, Mr. Trump, thank you for the memorial. Nobody else. Everything else I do, people have forgotten it's gone. It's gone. Short memories. But the Vietnam memorial is like something I'm very proud of. And it's beautiful, right on the East River. I mean, it is really beautiful. Looking at one of my buildings, actually, but I didn't build it for that reason, because I didn't even own the building at that time, so that's good. But I'm very proud of that. But people, they, they just, they love it. They thank me, thank me, thank me, and everyone else forgets. So I've been fighting hard for the vets, because the vets are being treated like third-class citizens in this country, and they're our best. They're our best. And... When I came here, when I came here today, they said, we have literally seven or eight in one day, hundreds, I don't even know what the number is, hundreds, many hundreds of letters from Vietnam vets thanking me. Do, can you bring them up? Just bring them up if they, you have them. Do you have them someplace? Where are they? Oh, here they are. Wow. Oh, wow. Look, look at this. This is, this is from veterans. These, each page, different letter. This is one day. We have so many. And each one, it's amazing. Each one is a separate page. Each one of these letters, this is one day. This took place over the last two weeks. I've been fighting like hell. And each one of these is a story about what a disaster the Veterans Administration is. It is the most corrupt group of people in all of Washington. And the politicians, the politicians in Washington are dishonest and or incompetent. But there is nothing like worse that happens to our vets. And I mean, I could show you back, because back in the office, we actually have now offices in Iowa, we have a great group of people, great group. Chuck is here someplace, and Steph, and we have great people. But you know, they said that back in the office, you can multiply this times 10, by times 10. This is less than a day. So, and these are letters of horrible stories and horrible complaints. The waiting list as of last Wednesday was longer than a waiting list has ever been in the history of the VA, the waiting list to see a doctor, okay? I mean, who can do better than Trump? I fix things, I get things to work, I manage. So, we'll wrap it up, but I, I will say this, look, you have to understand we have a country, and my slogan, I actually marked it up, we copyrighted it, can you believe, because other people were using my slogan. They see, I get, by the way, I get the biggest crowds, I get the biggest standing ovations, everybody knows it, the press never reports it, and the press doesn't understand that there's a room like this in another part of the building where it's packed also, with its closed circuit. You people did better with real estate than they did, but that's okay, because I'm, I'm going over to see them right after this to say hello, but they're hearing what we're saying. But the press is very dishonest, the political press. You know, I've dealt with a financial press, and, and you know, look, maybe it's simpler because it's numbers. You have, that, you have it, you don't have it, maybe it's simpler. But, and, and by the way, a lot, of the, a lot of the political press is great like 30, 35%, but some is so dishonest. You'll have a meeting like this, and they'll say, the crowd was minuscule. Somebody said this is the largest crowd they've ever had in Iowa here, the whole thing. I mean, that's what I've heard. I don't know. But they'll say, 
Mr. Trump spoke in front of a crowd. You know, record crowds. Mr. Trump spoke in front of a crowd. They're, they're so dishonest. It's so terrible. And, you know, one of the things I say is that I have an expression I use a lot in speeches. The American dream is dead, but I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before, okay? I mean, I say that. I say that. And I say it a lot. The American dream is dead, and I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before. So I go home, I see my wife. And, you know, all my speeches are live. It's like live on CNN, live on Fox, it's live. How would you like to do this? You're always live on television. And if you make one little mistake, they'll say, oh, it's terrible. I'm on live. Everyone else, they don't even have cameras. You know, the other candidates, they come, there's no cameras. With me, I'm on live. My wife called up, darling, you're live all over the world. I say, oh, that's great. That makes me feel great. But you know what? I could do without it. I could do without it. So I say that. The American dream is dead, gonna make it bigger, better. Okay. So she said, darling, that was terrible what you said today. What? You said the American dream is dead. I said, no, no, but I'm gonna make it. No, no, you didn't say that. You should have said that. So I say, turn it on. You know, the TiVo stuff, right? I say, turn it on, let me see. And it has me, the American dream is dead. Click, end, next subject. And I go, whoa, whoa. That's bad, right? <laughs> no, I, I go like, oh, man, that's terrible. She was upset with me. She said, why didn't you say it properly? I said, I did. So they have the American, because you know how bad a statement that is? So the people in the room loved it. But the people in the, on television didn't get to hear it. But make America great again. So I actually copyright it because I'm using that a lot. And I think it's a great statement. I think it's a great statement. And all of the candidates have, you know, different statements. You know, one of them has, I think, rise. I'm saying, excuse me? <laughs> Whose is that? Whose is rise? They have rise. Whose is that? Who came up with rise? That's not a good one. Probably paid a million dollars to some guy, you know, <laughs> to come up with that one. No, but I love it, so I copyrighted. So I actually won the copyright. I got a copy. I didn't even know I could do that. Good lawyers. I have very good. I'm very good with contracts. Don't you want that? <laughs> Don't you want that? You know, a woman got up, because I actually think I'm a nice guy. I love people. I have lots of fun in life. I'm, I've been great at what I do. I've had big success. Hey, went to the best school. I was a good student. I got out. I built a fortune. I had a book, The Art of the Deal, which everybody read probably, right? Oh, it's right there. Look at them. So, so, but every, it was a, you know, num I guess the number one selling business book of all time. I do the show called The Apprentice. It becomes a big hit. Let's see how well it does without Trump. You know, I told NBC I'm not doing it. They were angry at me. They came to my office, the head people from NBC and Comcast, just before I announced. They came to my office to see if I would not announce would I do The Apprentice? And you know, it's big, it's a lot of money. Hey, did you see, I put down $213 million. That's what I made from The Apprentice. And you had some clowns on top, there's no way. And then I said, I'll tell you what, I'll bet a year's salary, your salary, not my salary, because if they made a mistake, I would. <laughs> if you're right, I'll pay you a year's salary. If you're wrong, we'll split it, you'll do it the other way, right? So then they found out I was right. I'm right, so 230. So when I, when I do, you know, when I say I'm not doing it, Mark Burnett called me, good guy. He did The Apprentice, Survivor, you know. He said, Donald, you're turning down an extension. Nobody turned. Let me tell you, what I'm giving up, not only there, but what I'm giving up in deals that I'm not doing, it's, you know, somebody said, oh, how much will the campaign cost? That's peanuts compared to what I'm giving up. That's peanuts. The campaign is my, my smallest cost. I'm doing it to make America great again. That's all. So what happened is a number of people started using that phrase. And we actually, can you believe this? I sent them legal letters. You know, they were saying, and we'll, but they don't say it like I do. They say, we'll make America great again. Everyone says, 
just another politician. It's not going to happen. We will make deals that are so good with foreign countries. Remember this. We're being drained. We're being fleeced. We're being fleeced. The Iran deal, 24 days to go in. Think of that. You know, it's funny. I love the idea of a nuclear deal, but we got to do it from strength. We should have put the sanctions on double and triple and made the real deal. Not, and not have a guy like Karen. <laughs> not had a guy like Karen. I mean, I watched him on television the other day. I said, is he bright? Is he bright? He's trying to justify 24 days. So first, before you get to the 24 days, it's a long process, okay? You say, we're going to do it. They're going to fight you. They this. Probably take who knows how long it takes. Then when, the, when it starts, 20, by that time, they can move all, they can move whatever they want. They're going, oh, there are no missiles here. You know, six months later, oh, no, oh, this is lovely. Oh. <laughs> They're so honorable. You know, the Iranians, these are great people. And they are, they're smart. They're great negotiators. You know, the Persians are great negotiators. But there are two things. We could talk about the accelerators. We could talk about the fuel. We can talk about a lot. That a lot of people, you know, I had an uncle who was great up at MIT, Dr. John Trump, really smart guy. He said, what you can do with this stuff. So they have all this period of time, all this period of time. But there are two things that you cannot ever justify. One is 24 days, and remember this, it's much longer, because before that time limit starts a whole process. So one is 24 days, can't be sold. Nobody can sell it. Why isn't it like immediate? You know, they say anywhere, any place, et cetera, any time. But why isn't it immediate, right? Why isn't it immediate? So you can't sell that. I'll tell you what the other thing you can't sell, hostages. We got four people over there. And I guess you could say the third thing is $150 billion that we give them. So they are going to be, I mean, if they were a stock, I would buy so much of Iran right now. I would, do you saw how good I did with picking stocks? You see that? All those stocks went up, I think, 48 out of 50. I was very good, even though I'm, it's not even my business. I don't do stocks for the most part. But I, I just looked and I said, you know what? It's like, let's do some of this. And I was proud to do it. In fact, I sold them because I wanted people to see. And they saw, I, I had a great record. How, what was it, like 47 out of 52 or 51? Went up. Well, if I were a stock picker, if I were a country picker, you gotta pick Iran. Because what we have done is we have made them a tremendous power, an extraordinarily rich country. Think of it. We're giving them 150 billion and much more. They're gonna end up with nuclear. You're going to start a Nuclear revolution. People are going to... You, wait till you see what happens now with other countries. Israel is devastated, as they should be. Israel has been hurt. I mean, I don't get it. I have friends of mine that are Jewish that contribute to Obama. And I say, and smart people, I say, what are you doing? What are you doing? It doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. But Israel is... is going to be, I mean, this is a real problem for Israel, and it's a real problem for us. And then you see today, I don't know, did you see the, the picture of Obama with a gun to his head? It's a caricature of Obama, where the <clears throat> supreme leader, I see on NBC the other day, they said, the supreme leader, he's not my supreme leader, don't call him the supreme leader. It's a great term. That's like a term that Trump would use, supreme leader, that's great. <laughs> He's not my supreme leader, so don't use that term. Say the leader of Iran. Don't say the supreme. They say the supreme leader. And he said today or yesterday, a big, big thing in the papers. It says, don't mess with us. Don't mess with us. And you know, the chief negotiator, who I watched on television, and as soon as I saw him, I said, this guy Kerry cannot deal with him. Cannot deal with him. It's a different level. It's like the New England Patriots playing my high school football team. <laughs> no, that's what it's like. That's what it's like. And you can't deal with them. And you have to, you, I mean, it's so devastating to see what happened. But the three things, the money, okay. And then the other two things, 24 days, and why don't we get? So they said about the prisoners, this, I, I mean it. They said, we didn't want to talk about the prisoners because it would complicate the negotiations. Think of this. You know what it is? We, fellas, we want our prisoners back before we start. Give them back. They'll give it. If you have the right messenger, 
There are people in this room who could do it good. There are people here. I would do it great. You walk in, fellas, before we start. This should have been done before we start, not at the end. It should have been done before. This should have been done. I mean, I call it the world's longest negotiation, okay? Just went on forever. And we just kept giving up, giving up, giving up. We'd say, we'd like this. No. Oh, how about this? No. We have nothing. But if you went in right at the beginning and said, here's the story. First of all, you should have increased the sanctions and done it. It would have been very easy, actually. That would have been almost as easy as Ford. Maybe easier. But, <laughs> but you say right at the beginning, fellas, no women in the room, sadly. They haven't figured that one out, that the women are smarter than the men, but that's okay. They'll figure it out. In about 150 years, they'll figure it out. You say, fellas, you don't want them. You don't need them. We need them up here. It'll be good for the deal. Let the prisoners out right now, please. Let them out. Come on. They'll do it. We don't even ask. And then I see Kerry and Obama on television the other day saying it was too complicated. Too complicated. And yet, according to certain papers, a couple of years ago, we gave them a nuclear scientist. Does anyone even know that? We gave them a nuclear scientist, right? It's hard to believe how incompetent our country is run. So, so, it's an honor to be with you, and I will tell you, if I'm elected president, we will, and very quickly, make America great again. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.